Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EDI Civil Rights Office Title IX Unit's celebration of the 50th anniversary of Title IX. My name is Chandra Bhatnagar, and I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Civil Rights. I lead our Civil Rights Office, and on behalf of EDI and the Civil Rights Office Title IX Unit, it is my honor to welcome you all to today's event. We're thrilled that you could join us as the UCLA community marks this historic occasion. However, before we get started with the proceedings, uh, we'd like to pose a simple question. Why are we here? Well, we are here because 50 years ago, Congresswoman Patsy Takamoto Mink, the first woman of color elected to Congress, led the effort to write and pass Title IX, which President Nixon ultimately signed into law. Congresswoman Mink was a passionate advocate for racial equality and for gender equality and civil rights, and she had a long and distinguished career in public service. The title of the legislation that Congresswoman Mink co-authored in 1972 was the Title IX Amendments of the Higher Education Act. In honor of her contributions to gender and racial equality, the law was later renamed the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act in 2002. Congresswoman Mink's bill was simple. It stated that no one should be excluded from participation or face discrimination on the basis of sex in any educational programs or activity receiving federal assistance. The legislation only had 37 words of language, but as we will hear from our panelists today, those 37 words have transformed our nation. Over the past half century, our country has made monumental progress in advancing equality and equity for all students, including by narrowing gender gaps in sports, expanding opportunities in science and technology, protecting students from sex discrimination and sexual violence and sexual harassment, Today, more women and girls are participating in professional sports, science, math, and technology than ever before. Their leadership, their achievements, their success is a testament to the legacy of the generation of women activists throughout American history who fought for equality and equal opportunity. But while there has been tremendous progress, there remains much work to do. Indeed, our country currently faces an inflection point for the economic security, safety, health, and well-being of women and girls. COVID-19 has exacerbated pre-existing economic, health, and caregiving crises that disproportionately impacted women and girls long before COVID struck. Following the economic collapse, women's participation in the American labor market has plummeted to its lowest level in over 30 years. In addition, rates of gender-based violence have risen significantly. Most recently, the fundamental right to reproductive freedom that had been recognized for the high, by the highest court in the land for a generation has been overturned. In addition, rates of violence and reports of discrimination faced by LGBTQIA plus people have risen exponentially in recent years. In August, Victor Madrigal Borlaus, the United Nations Independent Expert on the Protection Against Violence and Discrimination Based on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, completed a country visit to the United States. The independent expert issued a statement that he was deeply alarmed by the widespread profoundly negative riptide created by deliberate actions to roll back human rights of LGBT people at a state level. He noted that those included deeply discriminatory measures limiting comprehensive sexual and gender education for all and access to gender affirming treatment, sports and single sex facilities for trans and gender diverse persons. So with these obstacles, we will need to work together over the next half century to achieve the full equality and the promise and dignity for women, girls and LGBTQI people that Title IX um, affords. Only a sustained and collective effort can give life to the promise of Title IX. So with that introduction, it's now my pleasure to introduce UCLA's Title IX Director, Mohamed Cato, who will moderate our conversation this afternoon. Director Cato was raised in Southern California. He received his bachelor's degree from UC Irvine and subsequently obtained a Juris Doctor degree and a master's degree in urban planning right here at UCLA. From 2014 to 2017, Director Cato served as the Assistant Director of the Equal Opportunity Office and Deputy Title IX Coordinator at Western Washington University. In 2017, we welcomed him here to UCLA and we're thrilled to have his leadership today. Without any further ado, Mohammed. Thank you, Chandra. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone again uh, to today's event. Um, we have three esteemed uh, panelists. And before we get started with the discussion, I'd like to provide a little bit about uh, a little bit of background uh, for each panelist. Uh, so I will start off with Ms. Kelly Inoue Perez. Ms. Kelly Inoue Perez is a UCLA Athletic Hall of Famer, 
beginning her 17th season as a UCLA head softball coach in 2023 and has an overall record of 723 wins, 190 losses, and one tie. I repeat, 723 wins. So I'll do the quick math for everybody. That's basically an 80% win percentage. I wish some of my teams in LA uh, could boast that present percentage. Um, Kelly earned the second Pac-10-12 Conference Coach of the Year Award of her career after guiding the Bruins to their sixth consecutive Women's College World Series, an 11th Pac-10-12 championship in program history with a 47-7 record. The Bruins pitching staff ranked first in the country with 23 shutouts, as well as having four players rank in the top 10 in the conference in home runs, including coaching the NFCA Player of the Year, as well as back-to-back -back winners of both the Collegiate Women Athlete of the Year and the prestigious Honda Cup. Her staff was also honored as the 2021 NFCA Division I West Regional Coaching Staff of the Year. Thank you for joining us today, Kelly. Our second panelist is Ms. Christine Nicole Simpson, Simmons. Ms. Christine Simmons' vast experience as a leader, entrepreneur, speaker, and executive has garnered her trailblazing appointments and accolades in some of the most prominent organizations in the world. Christine's operational expertise, ability to monetize, impact, and execute strategically has spanned global organizations from Magic Johnson Enterprises to the LA Sparks, to Disney, to NBC Universal, and recently the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And I should also add that she did a little work at UCLA as well. She's the most interesting mix of a creative business visionary that can not only ideate, but more importantly, implement all while inspiring everyone she comes into contact with. From producing to consulting to her clothing line, there's no stopping this creative business visionary. And our third panelist is Ms. Candy Smiley, Candy N. Smiley, I should say. Ms. Candy N. Smiley has championed civil rights compliance for over eight years. She began her career in civil rights compliance at Howard University as the Title IX director. She continued this work at the University of California, Los Angeles, first as a deputy Title IX director and currently as the interim director of staff diversity and equal employment opportunity compliance here. Candy has conducted and overseen countless civil rights investigations, mentored high level administrators through state and federal agency investigations and drafted policies and procedures to comply with state and federal law. She has created the curriculum for and facilitated hundreds of trainings and workshops for both the university and the business community. Ms. Smiley earned her Juris Doctorate from the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. So please help me welcome our three panelists and thank you again. Thank you, Mohammed. So I guess the first question um, I have uh, for the group, uh, especially in light of celebrating the 50th uh, anniversary of Title IX is, can you share with us what Title IX has meant to you and how it has impacted your life and your career? And I guess we can start with uh, Christine. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. So good to be here. And Kelly, Candy, like this is the best, most beautiful energy uh, of a panel to be on. So I'm so honored to be here. Um, that being said, you know, I think there are so many aspects of Title IX that have personally affected me. You know, I was a three-letter athlete in high school and, you know, I'm I'm of a certain age where, you know, it wasn't necessarily as visible and we didn't have as many champions um, as there are now. And there's still lots more work to be done. So first as an athlete, and then to go on to have, you know, a, a career in sports, we see it at every turn, right? And we understand what it means uh, to be able to provide that equitable opportunity for these athletes uh, going forward. So I've been able to um, not only benefit from some of it personally, but also help pave the way to continue to operationalize it. I think that's key. Oftentimes you have, you have legislation 
And then once you get the legislation passed, right, then you actually have to change hearts and minds, and then you have to operationalize it. And each one of those is a journey on its own. And so for me, it's something that I've been able to do personally, both in sports, a little bit in entertainment when we come to equity, but we're talking about sports today. And for me, um, it's been my life's work um, and, and I've really uh, enjoyed it and, and benefited from it, but we still have a lot, a lot more work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Candy. Thank you. Yes, it's so great to be here. Um, I like to say, as an Indiana native, I like to say that Title IX has given me purpose. So growing up in Indiana, anyone knows anything about the Midwest, you know that they will not allow you to live unless you love sports, specifically basketball. So I played sports all the way through elementary school and high school. It was a great experience, but I remember being six years old, laying on the floor and announcing to my mother after watching an episode of Matlock that I was going to be an attorney. She said, okay. So that's what I set my journey for. And as I got into high to uh, college and realized that my WNBA dreams were not going to quite come true, I decided that, you know what, maybe I could be a sports and entertainment attorney. Um, but as life has it, sometimes you go in different paths. And I did a lot of corporate law and it was okay, but I had this feeling that I wanted to help people. That's why I became an attorney in the first place. And the corporate law was helping a lot of, you know, people with money get more money. And that's great. But I wanted to do something a little more grassroots. And so I saw this position in Title IX. And I thought I can put together my analytical skills and my love for helping people in the same role. This is beautiful, right? And a lot of people think about Title IX as equality in sports, and that's a great thing, but it's also about making sure that people feel included, right? That you get to an, a place, yes, you are here, but you should also feel welcome. And so working with um, to make sure that we prevent sexual harassment, sexual assault, dating, domestic violence, and stalking, all of those things really serve my purpose of using my analytical skills and my love for helping people. And um, as uh, Christine said, we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you, Candy. Uh, and I should just add um, that we will be taking questions in the chat. So if folks have uh, questions, please feel free to um, ask or put those in the chat box. And uh, Kelly. Um, first of all, thank you, Muhammad, for the introduction, and I am just blessed to be with all of you and my two beautiful sisters here, Candy and Christine. I look forward to collaborating with everyone. Um, when I think about Title IX and what it has done for me and my career, it's just pure gratitude. Gratitude for opportunity, um, and as both of them said, there's still work to be done about creating more opportunity um, for us female athletes and coaches, but when I think about my path as a student athlete, um, understanding that there's so many that did did gave back to the sport for the love of the game, not necessarily as a career path or the opportunity to necessarily earn what they worked for, but they did it for the love of the game. So I have, when I say gratitude, those that walked before me are have given me the opportunity to be able to pursue a career that I'm passionate about to be able to give back my goal and my, my purpose is to empower these young female student athletes to be able to be leaders in life. And I'm proud to be able to say that I can be a role model. You know, I am a, a leader, but I'm also a wife and I'm also a mother. I'm also the breadwinner in my household. And Title IX has created the opportunity, opportunity for me to be a softball coach at a big time university, um, being able to give back, but also continuing to, to grow the sport. So I love what I do. I'm surrounded by amazing individuals. Um, and the fact that I can be here 33 years later, still here at UCLA from a young student athlete coming to just get a degree and earn a scholarship to be in a leadership role. Um, I much gratitude for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Kelly. Um, the next question um, I have is, can you share any challenges that you have faced as a professional in your field and any advice or guidance you can provide for individuals interested in pursuing a career in your field. And I'll, I'll ask you, Kelly, um, start off with you to answer that. Um, you, you know, it's, we've, I've had great discussions with, with my staff and others, and, you know, we're constantly talking about challenges, although I say nothing is too hard. Um, there's always a solution, but there's definitely been challenges. And when I think about, um, I always think about 
the past and where we were and um, where we're going, but really being clear about you know, what's happening now and um, the challenges, I think, in coaching in general. You know, I factually, Charles E. Young and, um, and Judith Holland, um, at the time, the administration did a great job of really getting compliant with Title IX. In the 70s and 80s, UCLA did a great job of really, really uh, out of the gates, really putting ourselves in a position of being compliant. And um, where we are today, you know, it's not as compliant, meaning there were, I think the numbers where there was a greater than 90% of females were, were actually be able, able to get into the coaching profession, um, but there wasn't a lot of money that was involved. So the opportunity was there, which I say I'm, I, I'm grateful for, yet the money and salaries wasn't there. And, and now that the money has grown in our sport, there's greater TV time, there's um, there's a lot of prestige in being able to coach these big time programs. Actually, the amount of female coaches has dropped off. Um, so we're always fighting the battles of when you talk about equality, um, when you compare to some of the male sports versus the female sports, we're not there yet. You know, being able to have equitable salaries or bonus structures or um, even budgets, there's a lot of things that are still, we're still fighting for, um, for that opportunity to truly be in compliance with Title IX. Um, so those are those are some of the things. I think there's a lot of obstacles that we're continuing to, to fight. But I think when you talk about some of those challenges as a coach, it's very, very real. Yes, you can be a coach. But as far as being able to be have the same equitable resources and um, possible benefits that you could earn, we're not there yet as far as being compliant. So I'm really, I think enforcement is something that we're really looking to be able to have. And things like this will bring awareness to be able to say that there are definitely some really great coaches and influencers out there in athletics that definitely deserve to be able to be rewarded, um, very similar to how some of the male role models are. But I think that you know, that's a challenge that I'm, I'm always looking to have a voice to try to make change. You know, if I could jump in, Mohammed, like, I love that point, Kelly, where so many times, you know, women are brought in, they turn a program around, they turn a situation around, and then the second it actually then blows up, and they could reap the benefit of those rewards, both monetarily or from a visibility perspective, right, and then it's handed off to somebody else. And I think that that's another critical point in time where we are in this journey, right? So, so one, it's just getting folks in the door and getting them the opportunity. But we're at a point now, Mohammed and, and, and everyone, where we don't want to just get the opportunity. Exactly. We're not just doing this for exposure anymore. We're not, it's not equitable, it's not fair. And, and nine times out of 10, we're working harder because what we've been given is a bigger challenge, right? And so, so how is it that it, we, you know, and all of us that do this work joke about, you know, we know that we'll be equal when we can be mediocre, right? And, and unfortunately, we still don't get to be mediocre and we actually have to overcome and be superhuman. And then it gets, it gets point, uh, pushed off. The other point that I really love about what you were saying, Kelly, is that it's this entire ecosystem that we have to hold accountable. Right. So, yes, people want to automatically look to the teams or to the universities or to those, you know, the, the people that are paying the checks, if you will. But there's a bigger ecosystem within sports that we really have to hold accountable, especially when we look at the economic ecosystem of it, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at those TV deals, we're looking at those sponsorship deals, we're looking at the NIL deals that our athletes are getting. If we, if those things aren't on par, then it's gonna be really challenging, especially on the pro level, for any player to be able to get an equitable uh, paycheck any day of the week. And it's because many of those team owners absolutely would love to pay, you know, at an equitable rate but the business model just isn't there in that society, right? So we have to continue to look at society. And, and then the last point I'll make is, you know, there's this different phases of changing hearts and minds, I think. And, and I often used to say when I was at the Sparks, it's not about, you know, empowering young girls. That's a big part of it, but it's more about enlightening men and young men about what those women and young girls can do. Because once they're enlightened and they're exposed, then just all of the, you know, the light bulbs start flashing when it comes to the business opportunities and the conversions we see, for the young boys, like, you know, my son grew up watching Sparks. That was his first exposure to pro basketball. So so when people would ask him, that's who he would say was his favorite team, right? And they'd be like, yo, little man, you know, who's your favorite team? Like Sparks. They'd like, look at me crazy. And I'm like, excuse me, son, they mean men's team, right? So like, I shouldn't have to do that. But, you know, and, and because that person was a little less enlightened, my young son then was able to enlighten him. And the more that we teach and expose young then it easier it is, but we have to attack it at all every age at this point now, so we can really see the change we need to see, and we need to see it quicker. 
so so Christina, I want to circle back and ask both you and Candy to answer that 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 question. I, I guess one one thing that I am uh, curious about is again, you know, what advice or guidance would you give others in who are interested in in pursuing your your field? But before we get there, um, if if you two could share your experiences in terms of the challenges that you faced in in your respective fields. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we've heard it, right? So you walk in a room, they never know, you know, you, there's always these expectations, you know, oftentimes I would be, you know, the, the, the team president and they'd look to the mail next to me for, for the decision. And he's like, I don't know, ask my boss, right? So like, you get that all the time. I think that, you know, one of the challenges that we saw, uh, especially when uh, I was leading the team at the Sparks was, again, that enlightenment aspect of it. So instead of targeting your typical fan, uh, real hardcore basketball fan, you know, instead we went to, you know, a lot of different other markets to say there are ways, there are different entry points when it comes to um, sports. And so instead of focusing on the challenges so much, I think what I like to do is look at the opportunities um, in this space, because I think we've all heard it. You know, I, 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 especially me, I'm tall. I love to wear heels. I'm girly when I want to be. I'm a tomboy when I want to be. I'm all of those things. And you don't see that in sports either, right? So how we present and what is expected of us and, and, and how our athletes show up, you know, these women, 99% of these women have their degrees, advanced degrees, some of them, their mothers while they're playing. I mean, if you look at my girl Candace, like she came out as a rookie, had a baby, came right back. Like this is what's happening. And so, so those challenges are there. It's the mindsets we have to change. We have to continue. And now we have to kind of look at the microaggressions as well. You know, I think that what's happening now is we're getting away from the blatant sexism and blatant racism that is there. And we and we have to um, we have to also not let them divide us when it comes to culture. Like I love when Kelly, when you said my sisters, because we are sisters, we're all sisters in this together. And a lot of times, what's happening is that we're there's a wedge being drawn, um, and and race and 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 gender is being you know pitted against each other. It's good to acknowledge the challenges that each different community has. Me as a black woman, Kelly as an Asian woman, an indigenous woman, a trans woman, all, you know, everybody has their different challenges and we want to acknowledge that and make sure that we address it, but they never should be pitted against each other. So I think those are some of the challenges that we're seeing now in, in getting, in having these careers. You know, more and more, we have this great pipeline of women in the front office that is in the WNBA, and that's not translating until recently into the WNBA. And nine times, out of, I'm sorry, into the NBA. And nine times out of ten, those are former players. So those in the front offices aren't getting those opportunities. They're still going to male counterparts um, at these other teams as well. So look at the pool you have. Right, we have all of this. We have these feeder teams that are ready to go when it comes to both the business and the basketball side or the sports side of whatever it is and make sure that you're tapping into that talent pool for those folks that are making those decisions. I think that that's one of the ways we can overcome one of the challenges and then continuing to unite all of us in our, in our causes together because we're, we're obviously stronger together than we are divided and not let them pit us against each other. Thank you. And I'll just add for our particular area, because we deal with so many complaints, there was a Me Too movement, and then there was so much change in federal law that there was an onslaught of cases. And it continues to be so, right? There have been more cases on the health side. And so we're seeing all of these things. And it can sometimes be easy to just say, this is too much and just sit in a puddle and not strategize, right? But I think again, what I see our work in Title IX in this particular area is in inclusion. And I think to Christine's point, a lot of times we'll see where my form of Title IX, where we're talking about sexual harassment and sexual assault, is being um, separated from the sports side of Title IX. And it's not, right? If we think back to, I believe it was Sedona Prince who highlighted the inequity of the weight room at the Final Four, right? And that was just seen as an NCAA thing. That's a gender discrimination situation. But for some reason, it never came to the Title IX office. It was never a Title IX investigation or an assessment. And I think the reason is, is that in society, we somehow convince people who are in marginalized communities to fight amongst themselves for the scraps, as opposed to requiring more from the people in the majority, right? We can come together on both sides of Title IX and make a greater impact. We can come together 
with Title IX and other Title VI and Title VII issues and come together for larger investigations, larger assessments, and put a bright light on it. Because we understand that people have short memories, right? So we have these big cases, we have these big changes in laws, we have the 50th anniversary, and then people forget about it. And we don't want them to forget about it. We have to continue the fight and we have to be creative in ways to take this to another level. And so for any advice or guidance for people interested in pursuing this career, one, you have to have thick skin because this is not an area where people are going to applaud you. It just doesn't happen, right? Especially with Title IX investigations, a lot of times there's really no happy ending. The best emotion you can hope for is relief, right? And you have to understand that. But you also understand that you can stand in your power and fight the good fight from all angles. And you don't necessarily need applause for that. Thank you, Candy, and, and, and that's a good segue to, I, I think it sometimes can be easier to identify the problem, but how do you resolve, fix, address the problem? And for young professionals, particularly young women professionals who are looking to get into the fields that the three of you are in right now, again, my, my question is what advice, what, what, what guidance, um, you know, can you provide to young professionals who are who are looking to enter the job market? Um, Candy said it best: thick skin. It's a you're it's a battle, y'all. And 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 we've kind of lost a couple battles in this war. And um, you know, I've been doing this equity work for twenty years or so now. I started young, um, but not that young. Um, um, but I, one, I think to Candy's point about your purpose, really find your purpose in your piece um, and understand the environment you're going in. I've, I have for most of my career been inside big major organizations that were trying to push change. So when you're doing this work, you kind of have to understand what that, what motivates that organization, where, you know, were they, some were uh, started and rooted in, you know, the values that power this type of work. Some were not, you know, the entire, our entire society for the most part was not created for this type of work, right? So now we're trying to disrupt it. So, so understand, get a full lay of the land. So that way you're, because most of us that do this work, we're optimists. We're like these hopeless romantics. We're going to change the world and, and just coming with rose colored glasses. And, and it gives us the heart and the softness and the empathy to do this work. But at the same time, it, it can also internalize it and it can exhaust you. And if you're exhausted and you don't have the energy to do this work, then we don't have that warrior inside. So get a really good understanding, take off your rose colored glasses for just a second as you assess the situation and the role that you wanna get into. And then once you've done that, network, network, network. You really wanna make sure that that social capital is there because again, this work, while it's a battle, you have to build trust that you have to get people to trust you that you have the best intentions for both the organization and that person. And it's, it's hard, it's sensitive work, right? And so there has to be kind of a, a respect and a rapport of trust. Doesn't mean everybody has to like you, but you have to kind of have that respect and rapport and trust. Um, and, and then the last thing I'll say is set your boundaries early. Um, really make sure that you understand. I went in and I was like, I'll do everything, anytime to change the world because I have to, right? And that's just who we are as people who do this work. And that's going to burn you out. So set your boundaries early. And there's a beautiful window right now where that is being received by employers about belonging, about boundaries, about a, a healthier approach to, to work-life balance. balance. Um, more like harmony is what I try to look for. It's like sometimes it's sometimes the beat drops, sometimes sometimes the horns are blaring, but at some point the song sounds good, right? So so find your boundaries early. Put on put on that war vest and your war paint for a second, just so you can go in strong, but don't lose the softness and the empathy in your heart. Ooh, I love how you said all that, and I. I, to answer that, I, I truly, I love that you said thick skin because it's very, very true. Being a, a female in the coaching profession, um, 
have thick skin, but also put yourself in a, in a leadership position. Um, you know, a lot of in our sports in particular, a lot of girls have been coached by males before they got here. And there was even talk at times of, I would prefer to play for a male over a female, um, just on the ability to communicate um, on how things were taken. For example, men had the ability to yell with a tone and use language and, and have action um, that was tolerated because it was it was something that of how they presented themselves and no one really questioned it. You know, you see coaches that are very um, uh, aggressive with their style. That's just how they were yet as females, that's not expected to be able to come from a coach that we, sh you know, we, we should, and, and I, you know, we should have an awareness as well as your language and how you present yourself yet we're judged differently on how a male may communicate versus how a female. So for me, separate from that, I think as females in the coaching profession, I think it's really important to be able to coaching leadership in anything, be able to come together with what is your, your mission statement? What is your purpose? What is your business plan? What is your model that you can lead from? Because we have all have great information. We're very passionate of, about what we love to do. Um, and so I think about I think about two, two different styles of coaching. Old school coaching is what they used to call transactional. So just do what I say. So there were a lot of former athletes or people that have learned the game that could just, I know the game, I know the X's and O's, and they would say it, do this, and do it because I said so. So it's very transactional. Just do it because I said. Transformative is, is where we're living now. And transformative is, is really, really being okay with being ha taking the athletes and bringing them with you, being able to have a conversation, being able to really influence and inspire them, and actually being okay with hearing their voice. And it's a different time. So, you know, I talk about things, you know, I've, I have a phenomenal staff, um, Kirk Walker and Lisa Fernandez. And we spend a lot of time definitely talking about the X's and O's, but we are so much further, I believe, beyond in really influencing our, our student athletes. You know, we talk about things like having a mental, a mental wellness day. It's okay to take a day off. If you're not in a good place, then take a day off, do what you need to do, come back 100% and let's get after it. But old school, that's so weak. And as a female, of course, oh, that's, you know, you, you could be judged in that, in that, um, in that way, but transformative is we're with them. They give us a hundred percent. They're very passionate. They go all out. They do everything that we ask them to do because we're with them in the process. We can listen, we can talk, we can plan. And it's not something that we're afraid of. Um, but so I go back to once again, in the profession, some of the challenges, make sure that as if as a leader, have a plan, have a purpose, have a business model, stick to it, understand how there's standards and there's accountability and how you're going to communicate with your people. But also be very aware that transformative is, is where we need to be, especially with this generation. They want to be heard. They want to understand. They want details. They have questions. Their attention span may be a little shorter. And that's challenging in the coaching profession where you just want to get after things. But, you know, the old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care whether you're a male or a female, but I think it's put on us as females even more so because we're expected to be a certain way for them. And I'm proud to say I can be like a mom for them, but I could also be the leader and hold them accountable to the standards because it's clear. Our business model is clear. I have associate head coaches that hold them to the standards so the program can be healthy to be able to allow the girls to thrive because they understand what they're a part of. So to answer the question, I think it's important to be able to be really clear about why you're here and what your purpose is as a leader. And I'll just add to that, that yes, I think you need to be clear. You need to have a purpose in this. And like Christine said, you know, you need to keep your softness, right? I think it is a great tool and it's like a superpower to care and you need to care. In Title IX specifically, especially in this realm, there's a prefer, prefer this pre, excuse me a preference to have a law degree but you don't have to have one i think the other thing is is that what this work pushes you into is very difficult conversations and sometimes difficult conversations with high level individuals and i think when you're first starting off or even if you've been doing it for a few years you think to yourself Am I the right person? Is it okay for me to say something? Be passionate about what you do, understand what you do, research, and then speak and stand in your power. Speak up, let them know what's going on. Let them know the legal ramifications of doing the things. Let them know how you feel about it. You can get buy-in and then leave it there. 
because it can kind of whittle you down if you allow it to, but you need to give them, you know, book, chapter, and board verse, as they say sometimes, but give them the bullet points and then allow it to just kind of melt away and live your life. And, and I think we have a question from the audience. Um, Chandra? We do. Uh, thank you, panelists, for such a rich conversation. Uh, we have a question from the audience, um, which really connects uh, to the last answers that you gave. It sounds like the work you do is laden with a host of professional, cultural, and administrative obstacles. How do you find positivity and the spirit to keep doing the important work? And maybe we'll start with you, Christine. Oh, yeah, me. Um, why? No, I'm kidding. Um, just kidding. I think, you know, it's hope. It is, and it just, I think, hope of what is possible, you know? And then when you get those small wins, when you get, like, something recently not just, just happened where um, my son's playing AAU basketball, and um, one of his friends, who is white, um, said a racist joke. And we had to address it right away, right? And um, what warmed my heart was that one of the other parents that is white called me and said, I am mortified that I wasn't even involved in the situation, didn't step in and say something in the moment. And I should, so we're talking about like bystander training now, right? So now we're getting to this next phase where it's, yes, you hold the people accountable. I talked directly to the mom. We talked it through. We talked to the kids. We did all that, right? But also now we're going to that next level of, of participation in this where humans are standing up for humans, whether or not they're involved in a situation or not, right? And I think when I can hurt for my trans brothers and sisters, like I hurt for my own sister, you know, like that's when you know that this work is, is happening. Um, you know, and so when we, when I get to here, we see, you know, the Don Staley's of the world doing her thing. Right. And when we see, when we see these wins, you know, that helps fulfill us. And then around that same conversation that those same group of boys, um, two or three of them, they were having a debate about top five ball players of all time. And of course, Candace Parker's name came up and they were like, da, 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 da. and then one of the boys was like, girls, right? Two or three of the young boys went in stats, fundamentals, just bam. And I was like, of course, my son was one. And I was like, yes, let's go. So that gives you hope. And it you just continue to look like to the future because we know that we're going to get there. Um, it has to happen faster and it has to happen deeper. Um, and now that we're seeing other people uh, teaching the lessons, holding themselves accountable for their own education, that to me, give, that gives me hope as well. Um, I love that. You're so passionate, Christine. I love it. I, um, you know, when I, I think the key to, the key to success is, is to surround yourself with people that are just as passionate and committed to bringing awareness. So for us in our athletic world, we're definitely going for championships, right? You know, like our ability to win is, is a big part of our purpose and why people want to come and play softball for UCLA. Um, but once again, I surround myself with a staff that is, that understands how we win. People think we have culture here at UCLA because we win and it's just the opposite. We win because we have such, such strong culture. So when you talk about, um, just bringing awareness, you have to be okay with having difficult conversations. You know, so I recruit all over the world and recruit all over the country. And we bring athletes, student athletes from just different communities, cultures, um, you know, religious beliefs, backgrounds, everyone together. And I love that. And with that, we could all celebrate that and then say, we all have to come together and figure out how we're going to win a softball game. So being able to have difficult conversations, when I say that, we all may do things different at the dinner table than what we've learned at home, but how are we gonna to pull together, which I think is such a strong um, necessary life skill to be able to work together and, and, and um, be aware of what other people may do. That's not to say what you think is right or wrong, but the awareness piece, the learning, the education, I think you know we do a great job of, of, of really having difficult conversations about your perceptions of right and wrong, but how we're gonna to work together as, as a team, as a family. Um, so I think it's important to collaborate. It's important to have difficult conversations. It's important to teach our, our younger um, student athletes how to have conversations, how to address it. If somebody says something in the locker room that is inappropriate, what are you going to say? 
you can easily go to this corner of the locker room and have a conversation about, oh my God, I cannot believe she just said that. Or you're actually going to communicate and say, you know, that made me uncomfortable and it's not okay that you said that. So now, and then explain the why. And, but I think we do that. We pull together the, the difficult conversations, address how you would voice that opinion and be able to be prepared for a discussion. You know, or even if it came to when you talk about locker rooms, it's a sacred space. We can't manage that as a coach. I'm not in the locker room. So we talk about, you know, if someone has a strong opinion about something, we teach them. Maybe you ask, does anyone want to have a political conversation or does anyone want to have a conversation about, you know, gender and in, in, in anything regarding any possible thing that could be on the table. But instead of just throwing in the conversation in the middle of the locker room, you can invite people to be in. Or you can invite people into the conversation, but maybe not throw it in and expect everyone just to get it because I want to talk about it. So being able to educate, being able to influence, being able to talk and learn how to voice, use your voice, I think is something that is important. And you've got to surround yourself with people that are on the same page. And my staff, um, you know, our players, everybody understands that it's it's important to use your voice. And beyond this little bubble of, of athletics here at UCLA is the real world that I hope that they leave more educated and more aware that not everyone thinks alike, not everyone has the same beliefs, but I have no problem engaging in a conversation about how I can learn to be more aware of what's important to you, or maybe you can learn what's important to me, and we're still gonna work together to make this organization successful. So surround yourself and jump in, lean in and have those conversations. Yeah, and for me, I think it's, I can spend all day reading reports about the worst day of someone's life. I can spend all day in meetings having conversations with people, telling them that they're suspended, telling them that they're no longer going to be working at the university. All of that can be draining. It's what we call secondary trauma. And so I have to be very conscious about going out and finding wins. Sometimes I make a conscious effort to do university community activities that don't deal with my job. I want to go to a softball game. I want to go to a volleyball game. I want to go to a basketball game because I need to see the wins. I need to see the students and the staff members in ways that don't involve them getting in trouble, don't involve them having a bad day. And for me, that keeps me balanced. In order to come up with these training scenarios, I have to go out and search for issues that are happening on other college campuses that are happening in other businesses. So that's an onslaught, again, of negative energy. But I also make it a point to go out and look for the wins, look for the issues and the places that things are going well and celebrate that. And I think that is necessary and it needs to be deliberate if you're going to keep that um, harmony, as you put it, Christine, in your life, because yeah, balance is, is difficult to achieve. We have a couple more uh, questions from the audience um, that, that are really terrific and build off of what you've said. Um, firstly, how do you predict the recent Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade might affect the Title IX gender discrimination landscape moving forward. And I'm gonna ask two questions together to give you all an opportunity to speak to either one. And then the second question um, is, a critique of Title IX is that it is focused on gender at the expense of appreciating human intersectionality and identity more holistically. Is this a problem? Or as Nikki Giovanni has said, if Earth survives, gender and race are going to go. Do you agree? We have a terrific audience who's deeply engaged on these issues, as you can hear. So I'll leave it to Mohammed uh, to steer the conversation. I will lead that question towards uh, Kelly first. Wow, those were that was a lot of, that was a really deep question. I almost want to open it up with Candy and Christine, and let's have a Let's have a conversation. There was a lot said in there. I'm almost even trying to process that. But I, if we can, let's. I, I I'm, I'm going to open it up to all of us. Let's. Who would like to be able to speak to it? Because I'm still. There's a couple different things that were asked in that. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious, Kelly. In terms of the, you know, there was a question about the landscape in regards of of Title IX. I'd be curious, you know, Candy, if you want to speak to that. Yeah. So. I I think as far as Roe v. Wade, I think it was um, for a lot of people just being perfectly honest and direct, it was a blow. 
right? It was a blow for people to say this, this too. And I think we've been dealing with, especially over the last four or five years with the changes in Title IX. So there were quote unquote positive changes in 2011, 2014. And then those changes were erased, right? And it seemed to be um, something that wasn't um, centered on trauma and being trauma informed. And then this whole Roe v. Wade, just, I think it made people just say, what's the point? Like, why do we even try anymore? And I understand that as the first reaction because it knocked you down. But the goal is every time you get knocked down, get back up. And so what are we doing now? How are we moving forward? And I think um, for us, it goes back to what I said earlier. I think it's about inclusion, right? Yes, Title IX has provided some type of diversity, right? There are more women in school now. It's provided some type of equity, like there are more women's sports. Is it completely equitable? Not at all. Let's be very honest, right? But now I think we're moving towards inclusion. So often marginalized communities have been sent into an area to say, okay, we let you in, you should be satisfied. And we are not satisfied, right? We are here to make sure that people are welcome and feel comfortable. So we want to make sure, like Kelly said, that now that the money is there, there are actually more women coaches, right? We want to ensure that now that um, women are in all these places, girls are in all these places, that they feel comfortable and they're not silenced. Like reading the report about what happened in um, women's soccer, about all of these coaches and people possibly or allegedly knowing for so long and it allowed it being allowed to continue, that's because people aren't talking to each other. Again, the Title IX that deals with sexual harassment, sexual assault, gender-based discrimination, those investigations, we need to partner with the Title IX in the athletic departments because a lot of these issues are our issues. They're not divided. I think, you know, for, for me, and there's another question that's in there as well that I saw um, around kind of some people feeling like, okay, that's enough. You had your moment kind of thing. And I think, I think the reversal of Roe v. Wade really is a signal. It should be a bat girl signal, if you will, right, about what is happening in the psyche and in the rhetoric that's, that's, that's out there. And we are in a crisis moment when it comes to rhetoric and when it comes to politics. And I think the challenge is, you're right, folks are like, well, psh, I mean, at this point, like, what can I do, right? And because so many times, and we've talked about this, the justice system, all of these systems weren't set up for historically underutilized or, or marginalized communities, and, and then much less all of the intersectionalities that lie therein. So how do we keep going in, fixing it, fighting it? Okay, great, now we're over here, like, we're like that, that halftime show where she's spinning the plate, like now we're spinning this plate. Okay, that one's going, I'm gonna leave that. I'm gonna come over here. And, but then now that one broke, right? And now we're gonna go back to it. And that's exhausting. And now we're gonna get to go do that one again. Um, but it has to be a wake up call. And I think we have to kind of, it, you know, PR spin some things because everything has gone to politics and politicians. And that is very polarizing, right? And it becomes, you know, about that individual, right? And their politics. Let's talk about impact. What is the actual impact? And I know that a lot more of the marketing campaigns that are happening around this legislation are really just talking about the actual deaths that will happen, right? That that really abortions will still be had, but to the question about the intersectionalities and how gender and other categories of identity you know, aren't always recognized. Those are underprivileged, those that are of color, those that come from all of the, that have multiple identities are likely going to be the ones that die because they don't have this choice or a healthy way to do this. And so I think understanding it, it being a wake up call and a call to action to make an impact that happens to have to do with some politics is what we have to look at this as because you're right, there's a lot of people who are saying, all right, you know, me too, you guys had your moment, now let's move on. I'm tired of talking about this, I'm tired of, no. Well, you're gonna have to be tired. And, and we have to be relentless in that and it's exhausting. So, you know, we all do have to go to our corners but this is where we're gonna tap in those other voices too. You know, I remember when the um, Women's March first happened and I was at Sparks at that time and it was, oh, are you gonna go march? And I'm like, Y'all got that one, 
I do this every day, right? And that's okay because we need some people to go march. We need some people to run professional sports teams. We need some people, you know, that are lawyers and fighting this fight. We need some people that are kicking butt, winning a lot of softball championships. And <laughs> we need everybody. And then we need our guys to step in too, right? And, and that's where we need to tap in those voices. And so more and more, how can we get people that, to me, it was a call to say, okay, our, our, our typical ways aren't working. Let's do this differently and with different voices. So that way we can create it so that it is sustainable and it cannot be changed in the future. And that's a big, big ask. But with the brilliant minds that not only we have in this generation, but most importantly, the next generation, I'm really excited about what's to come. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Just working together. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kelly. No, no, no. I just think you guys, I, I appreciate just your words. You know, it was funny. Um, the Roe versus, Roe versus Wade was brought up um, as a question posed on um, in a post-game interview at the College World Series. And I remember saying, like, at the time, just almost shaking my head, like, what did you just say? Like, why are we even talking? We're, we, we're in the loser's bracket there, first of all. And you're asking me a question um, at that time that brought, greater emotion, not to mention it wasn't something that I was even prepared to even discuss. So I, I, I respectfully declined, yet one of my student athletes actually stood up. I mean, the whole room got a little uncomfortable because here we were at a softball tournament and we were being asked the question, you know, our female athletes are being asked this question in this moment, right? And I told them, I kind of put my hand on saying, you don't have to respond, you know, to this especially in this environment. And, you know, one of our athletes actually stood up and beautifully just said, you know, I think that there are a lot of things that are out of our control, you know, and decisions that are made and things that unfortunately we may not have a voice in, but that's not going to stop our ability to continue to have a voice on what we believe choice is, is a power is our most powerful asset. She said it beautifully, right? I went, oh my gosh, I was so proud. I wasn't prepared to even open my mouth about it. So even when I talk to it, talk to it now, I think, um, choice, you know, being able to have a choice, being able to have a voice, being able to to make those decisions is something that is obviously our, you know, one of our biggest assets to be able to have that opportunity. So anytime it comes to things that are 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 controversial in the sense that some people think this and some people think that, I, I think what Christine and both Candy has said, we have to stand strong, we have to use our voice, we're going to have to figure out what we can rally for, not get defeated, but continue to push forward and um, put ourselves in a position to continue to take a stance on what we believe is right. So I'll say to that, when it comes to the other question, I, that's what kind of kind of stumped me a little bit was when you talk to, you know, if the planet or if earth survives, gender and race are going to go, I get that, that hit me. I, you know, I'm fortunate. I have uh, associate head coach Kirk Walker, who is such an advocate to be able to just bring awareness to so many, he's, he's taught all of us to bring awareness to so many other you know, real serious situations that are happening when it comes to gender and inequity and all these things, diversity and inclusion, all of these things that I think it puts us in a position to realize you're right. It's not just about females getting more opportunity in, especially for me in my coaching profession, we're talking about people as a whole and being able to learn more, educate more, be aware more is something, and then enforce the ability to make sure that people I'm going to continue to use word awareness. People don't know when they cross lines, when they're saying things inappropriately or, or doing things inappropriately or not enforcing or not holding people accountable. Those are the types of things that I agree. When the If the world were to end, we are all just one big family. And I wish that we had the ability to have more awareness and compassion and, and, and also um, put ourselves in a position um, to, to be together as one. I think that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people coming together. It takes conversations. It takes education. It takes the ability to have follow through. And I think that's scary for some people, but I love the path that we're going on, being able to be more aware instead of just focusing on playing softball games. <laughs> we are in, we are, I'm surrounded by people that are really pushing me to learn more. And I think that's all we can do, right? Is continue to put, to bleed into or pour into more people on how we can make a difference every day. Now, I know we have four minutes left and I don't want folks to leave because this has been good, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, and here it is. it is. It has been said that representation matters. Why is representation important? And if each of you could speak from your own relative field, um, I think that would be helpful. 
So why does representation matter in the work that you do? Which one do you want to go first? I know. All it. <laughs> You're all, okay, let's start with uh, Candy. All right. Uh, for me, representation means everything. Um, from being able to see um, the WNBA come into being and seeing that it was a possibility, like the whole time growing up, I played basketball with my big brother and all throughout the neighborhood, but it was never a thought that I could potentially go pro. We were always just giving him the drills. If we were doing drills, we were doing more drills to make sure that he had the opportunity to go to the NBA. And so when I saw the WNBA and the possibility, I just exploded, right? It didn't happen for me, but at least I thought it was an opportunity. Um, in my particular field, just being able to see um, African American women or women in general be attorneys and be um, partners at law firms and be CEOs and presidents of universities. To see that means that I can possibly aspire to it. And especially for me, because I kind of switched careers midway through, I started off as an attorney and then switched to Title IX compliance. It showed me like there's another avenue that I can help people and have success. And now I need to think about the possibilities of moving up the ladder and what that looks like. And so being able to look and research all these universities and see all of these people thriving, it just gives me um, incentive. I'll say that. Christine. Uh, you know, when I was at UCLA, I was pre-med. I looked at my degree in physiological sciences. I thought the only thing you do is be a doctor or a lawyer. And so I was going to be a doctor and I was going to open health clinics across the country and save the world that way. And I was so busy uh, protesting and doing hypertension screenings in the hood and mentoring at UCLA and planning African grad that my grades sucked. And so I didn't get into medical school. <laughs> Um, and so that being said, though, that opportunity gave that gave me an opportunity to realize I could save the world a different way. But I didn't know that there, those were options. I was raised by a single mom, you know, and, and I didn't know what was there. I didn't know that you could run a sports team. I didn't know, you know what I mean? I didn't know how I didn't know my job at the Oscars existed. Right. So I think representation to be able to see what is possible, you know, because people like to to put special language and um, be behind closed doors and make it super secretive to make it seem like it's harder than it is. And it's not like we get in these big organizations y'all and you pull back the curtain. Nobody knows what they're doing, but they want you to think that they're super, super smart, but they don't know. I'm here to tell you, they don't know. So, and, but they need your brilliant ideas because if they keep doing the same thing, then they're not going to innovate in any way, right? And so that it, I don't, it's, I'm joking. They know what they're doing kind of most of the time. But it's that they're constantly changing and the world is innovating. And, you know, so they need more people with great ideas to come in and, and ideate. So the opportunity is there. I, I'll give you this when, and I talk about my son all the time, but when he did start going to those Sparks games, we had credentials, right? He's walking around Staples Center and he walked around like he owned the place, right? And he was like, he had his little friends there. He's like, they're with me. And in the meantime, I'm like, hey, hi guys, it's Christine. I'm And they're like, we know who you are, right? So, so understand he sees me exactly. in that space, right? Representation as a boss, as running the show. And so he's like, oh yeah, okay, I got this. I could do this, right? And not intimidated whatsoever. And we need that for our, all of our young women as well. And so whether it is in the media, whether it is in the sport, in sports, whether it's in platforms like this, you know, it's important. And, and you know, I, I battled with social media in the beginning because I am a private person. And I had a conversation with somebody that said, people need to see that your job exists. People need to see that your path exists. People need to see that you don't necessarily have to go get an MBA per se to be able to have a C-suite job in corporate America type thing. So, so I say all that to say, you know, we have to know that it exists. That's why representation matters. And now we're beyond just seeing it, but to the conversation Candy's been talking about this journey that we're on, right? So we've checked boxes, diversity. Okay, yep, yep, we got, we got a black girl, we got a black dude, we got it, you know, right, we all check the boxes here, but do we all have an equal say, right? Do we all have, are you actually listening to the ideas? You know, like, like Kelly said on the, you know, the, the youth, they need to be heard. 
And so are, are, are they being heard? And then, because if we bring, if you bring everybody in, you're not listening, you don't implement their ideas, you don't um, give them equal footing, you make it more uncomfortable, then it's worse than if you ever brought them in to begin with sometimes. So um, representation comes in a lot of different forms. Um, and these days being able to identify and self-identify and make sure that we meet people where they are has to be this next journey of representation with all the intersectionalities that we have in identity these days. Um, you get spoken beautifully. I'm simply going to say this to wrap it up. I think representation creates belief. And when you have the ability to be a role model, and we are fortunate to be on TV, to be able to be in the community on things like this, it creates the belief that anything is possible. And um, I think that is that is our job and our purpose is to be able to be those powerful females in leadership positions that have a voice and we're teaching those young ones that they can do anything and the opportunity is now. So we're very grateful to be in the 50th year of Title IX because the future is exciting. Um, but once again, your ability to lean in and go for it, oh yeah, it's possible. So you got to surround yourself with the right people and literally dreams can come true. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been amazing. Um, I, again, um, this has just turned out beautifully. Again, I wish we could stay longer, but I know folks, it's it's lunchtime, people have to <laughs> But thanks again um, to the three of you. This has been an amazing panel. And I also wanna thank everyone uh, for attending and playing a role in this as, as well. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully we can do more of this uh, moving forward. Um, but again, thanks. And I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Absolutely. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.